JPA repository is done right as a subtitle because I usually like if okay. Is that better? Okay. Because I usually like it if uh, not everyone's agreeing with me, so you get into discussion a bit uh, better. And if I can convince you that we're doing the right thing here, then uh, even better, I think, right? So my name is Oliver Gierke. I work for Spring, uh, Spring Source. I'm a member of the Spring Data team, uh, leading the three modules listed there, so the core module, the JPA module, and the MongoDB module. And there's some contact information, so in case you just want to uh, ask questions afterwards or what have you. Um, minor advertisement, we're hiring, uh, especially for the Spring Data team. So in case you're interested in working with, uh, for Spring Source with latest data technology, um, there's some open positions there. So just come by after the talk and uh, talk to me. So what is... Um, Spring Data all about. So the Spring Framework has been, or has had support for uh, data access technologies in a variety of means. So we're supporting JDBC and Hibernate and JPA out of the box already. So where is there room for further improvement? So there's, on the one side, uh, there's these emergent technologies called NoSQL databases, um, or non-relational stores in general. And um, on the other hand, there's some access patterns that you can identify when you're working with relational databases or, as in our case, uh, the JPA, right? So what I would like to do in the next uh, 40 minutes, hopefully, is some kind of big, giant refactoring uh, from um, a data access layer we've, I implemented with plain JPA, as you would do it nowadays. Um, and we'll introduce Spring Data JPA, the abstractions we provide there uh, step by step, and then see how far we can get with that, right? So a question before we start, Spring users, I think Sam has asked this before, it's probably quite a lot in here, but who's worked with JPA before? Okay, JPA Criteria API. Who liked that experience? Okay, that's usually a very little show of hands then. All right, so we will get into the, into the details later. Um, yeah, so the project itself is just like all the spring uh, projects nowadays, or at least most of them, uh, on GitHub, so you can find the project there. The sample code I show you uh, right now, or will show you in a few minutes, is at Spring Data JPA examples. Um, it contains a plain example project outlining a variety of ways how you can uh, approach spring data as well as the refactoring project we will see in a minute, right? Um, all right, so that's it for the slide section. We're doing quite good on that, I think. All righty, so what we have here, you should see it. I hope you can read that in a bit. I've increased the font size for the code examples quite a bit, but what we have on the left here is a plain Maven project. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Maven, it's just, in our case, the only thing that matters is that it allows us to build the project and uh, define the dependencies. It's um, a standard Maven project in terms of, okay, having the source main Java folders here, and it's less of a standard Maven project to the degree that I've added quite a few additional source folders to just uh, prepare some code snippets uh, to not to bore you with typing too much, right? So the um, the core abstractions we have here, or the two domain classes we want to discuss, is um, an account and the customer. And the relationship is, okay, or the business relationship is, we have customers that have accounts. And um, so what you see here is just a plain JPA entity. The customer has an ID, it's, it get, uh, gets auto-generated, and we have first name and last name, right? So um, it's, simple by intention in this case, right? The account then references the customer it belongs to and it has some kind of expiry date, right? So nothing really uh, spring depending, uh, or this depending here, right? Just plain JPA entities, as you probably have them in your applications uh, to a much uh, larger extent. So 
let's start with the before package. So assume we would, like, we would implement the data access layer with plain JPA. Uh, we would probably come up with something like this, uh, some kind of service interface and an implementation. Don't take the notion of se a service too seriously here. I just chose it because uh, we're introducing repositories in the next step, so I can not really name the account repository, the old account repository, account repository. I could because they're in a different package, but it's easy to get into name clashes and issues. So just name the service here, right? So we have the availability to uh, save accounts um, and find all the accounts that a customer maybe has, right? That's it. Customer service is a bit more sophisticated. We find a single customer by its ID. We save customers. We get all access to all customers. We have something called what we call pagination. So not accessing all the customers in one step, but rather a slice of the customers. Um, and you usually expose those by saying, okay, you have a page number, so to speak, and a page size. So you say you take the second page by a page size of 10 would retrieve you customer 11 to 20, right? Um, yeah, and we have the combination of pretty much the, uh, the query execution we have defined here with pagination, and that's down here in find by last name. I hope you can see that in the back there. Uh, we will get to the implementation. That's probably becoming better. So the implementation is pretty much straightforward, I think. Um, in some, or in very ma many projects, we've seen generic implementations of these CRUD uh, methods already. So what you would typically do is uh, implement the save method with uh, the decision, if it's a new entity, then call entity manager persist. And if it's a uh, already existing entity, then explicitly merge it, right? So we need the, the notion of is new to some degree here. And we implemented it in this case by just inspecting the, uh, the ID attribute of the entity. Okay. So for the, um, for the execution of a query, it's pretty much setting up the query, as you see here, um, taking the parameter, binding it to the query, and executing um, the query, right? And I'd argue that with a little bit of imagination, you can derive all the stuff from the method signature, right? We return a list, that means, okay, we want to get all the entities, not just a single one. Find by customer, somehow reads like a, like a predicate on, on the entity, so all the, with the customer, and we've given it a, uh, a parameter that we probably have to bind to the query, right? Okay, so just go on with the, with the customer service here. We have to manually uh, write code to find um, an entity by its ID, right? The entity manager find customer. Um, we have to write a special query to return all the customers. We have to write a query to return the slices or, or a subset of customers by uh, reducing the, um, the query results to the slice here, right? Um, the, the parts that can be improved here at that page actually, or at that, for that method, um, is that just carrying around two integers leads to the, to, pos to the possibility that in case your, your colleague refactors the, the method and switches around the, the integers, you uh, completely blow up the query because you get wrong results, right? So you can mix up uh, the page index with the page size, actually. And beyond that, you don't actually know about um, how many pages are there in total, actually. That's stuff that you would probably have to implement yourself on top of that abstraction, right? So you come up with some a page abstraction and what have you. All right. Um, we have to, um, so there's some, some uh, configuration in here. Let's go with the application context before. It just includes some general JPA infrastructure. That's not something I'd, I'd like to discuss in detail because that's just plain spring JPA setup, entity manager, factory, uh, transaction manager, and in this case, an embedded database. Um, as we've used annotation, we can use the component scan element and thus automatically detect 
these uh, components as um, spring components by the use of the add repository annotation, and we have transactions applied to them, uh, which is fine as well. And as we want to do a refactoring, what do you need for a refactoring in the first place? Test cases, right. So we have some test cases here, of course, um, because otherwise, I, I just, I think I read this on Twitter a few days ago. If you don't have tests for refactoring, you're just changing shit, which is true to some degree. Um, there's some test cases just uh, calling the, oh, that's the alpha package. We need to start here, All right? It's calling the customer service, calling find by ID, um, uh, find by customer, so it's executing the query. So it's pretty much using our implementation, right? So it's an integration test that uh, bootstraps a spring container and um, actually calls the methods of uh, exposed via the service interfaces. So I can just simply, for example, start with that one and execute it. And if everything's going right, there is this green JUnit window here. I probably put that down here. Um, and you see it's, um, yeah, we see some stuff going on in logs and um, the test case is green, right, so in the first place. All right, so now let's start with um, introducing the Spring Data JPA abstractions. What are we actually um, providing? Um, the, f the first, or the, the, the core of the abstraction is actually an interface-based programming model for repositories. So how does that look like? So in the first place, you just go ahead and decide which entities you want to actually manage. It doesn't have to be every entity, but um, you would typically start, in our case, with, uh, let's say, the account. So we create an interface and say, uh, call it account repository. And what you would do, or there's, there's by some means, you have to uh, let the Spring Data infrastructure discover this interface as a special Spring Data interface. And you can do this by either extending um, a, the core Spring Data repository interface, which and lets you type um, the interface to some types here. Um, or you can use an annotation. There's an annotation alternative saying add repository definition. Unfortunately, add repository was already taken by the core Spring Framework, so we had to come with something different. But just for the sake of simplicity, I'll stick to the interface, right? So um, we have declared this, this account repository here. So to use that instead of a manual implementation, we would simply um, auto-wire it into the implementation just to uh, be able to do a step-by-step -step refactoring, right? Account repository, call it repo. So, okay. Um, so we pretty much need the very same methods on, that we have on the implementation in the repository, right? So you've moved them just over here. Um, and change our, uh, let's go this way, move that here. And now we could just, instead of manually implementing that stuff, we could just do return repo.save. And in this case, we just delegate to the repository. There we go. All right. So, why is it saying generic type arguments? List. Why is that the case? Something's wrong here. We just have to compile the code correctly, and that should do the trick. Okay, that's fine. Um, so let's rerun our integration test um, and see what's going on here. And it should fail, and it actually does. For what reason? I mean, we're referencing a Spring component called account repo or of type account repository, and we don't actually have implemented one or declared one, I mean, how should that work, right? That's not going to work out anyway. So what you have to do to pretty much activate the Spring Data Infrastructure and let it pick up the uh, defined repository interfaces is that you just go ahead and say, um, there's a JPA namespace, a dedicated one we ship, 
same JPA repositories, and you get a base package, and you, I just pipe in the one from above here. Let me make sure I have co added the correct one. Yeah. So this declaration now causes the Spring application context actually this or scan this base package for repos Spring data repositories that either extend repository by some means um, or carry the annotation. And it will create Spring components, Spring Bean definitions for those interfaces. What's happening beyond that, I would probably just tell you in a second, but uh, it will cause a Spring Bean definition to be created and an object of some kind to be injectable into clients. So let's rerun the test case and we should see it succeed, right? So it's green here. So apparently our implementation code is pretty much the very same what we just had before, right? So, okay, let's walk through it step by step. So the very first thing we have here is the save method. And that the save method actually works is due to the fact that it, by some, not by magic, but by accident, implements um, or is of the very same type signature of the actual implementation backing that created Beam, which is the simple JPA repository. Yada, 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 there we go. Um, it's actually an implementation implementation class that implements a more sophisticated repository interface, JPA repository, which in turn is, uh, of course, a repository interface, right? So long story short, uh, what we actually do is we discover this interface here and say, okay, we create an, inst an instance of simple JPA repository and put a proxy in front of it. What we need the proxy for is I will tell you in a second when we discuss the second method, but that causes uh, the proxy to intercept the call to save, and then see, ah, this method is actually implemented by this, uh, by this clause here and delegates to it, right? So what's actually called under the covers is this save method, which surprisingly looks a bit like uh, the implementation we've seen, we've seen already except the fact that the null comparison of the ID is hidden behind a strategy that you can exchange so that you're more flexible regarding what, ent or what entities to consider as new, right? All right, so the CRUD methods go in here. So one could argue, okay, now I have to know how this method has to be named, what signature it has to have. That feels a bit hacky. I mean, we're not in the Ruby world, right? Um, so there has to be some kind of strongly typed interface that actually provides these methods. And yes, there is. There's simply the CRUD repository, not CURD. Oh my gosh. There's CRUD repository, which extends repository and in turn actually contains all the CRUD methods yet that you might want to expose uh, for your repository. And you could simply get rid of this method declaration by extending CRUD repository, right? So this would automatically pull in the, the type signature of this interface here, and in turn, simple JPA repository implements this interface, and we, get, we suddenly get all the methods listed. Just go here, and we could say repo dot, and you have all the methods in here. I don't know if you can see this in the back. In the back. It's count, delete, find all, uh, find one, uh, save, save all, yada, 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 all the count interfaces. So actually, I'd rec recommend if you start with, with very, something very simple, just extend the CRUD repository and you get all the CRUD methods. And only if you really don't want to, let's say, expose the save method or the delete method, then you can come up with, with your own method declarations in here that just have to match the signatures of the CRUD repository, right? All right, okay, CRUD is done this way. Um, what about the query, right? Or the method actually executing a query? So remember when the application context 
starts or, or bootstraps and we discover this interface, we actually take a look at the methods declared in this interface and decide what to do with them. For some, as you just saw, we decide to simply delegate to the, to the proxy, uh, proxy backing bean. And for some, we just decide, okay, if we can't find any other thing that we could delegate to, uh, we just think, okay, this has got to be a query method. You probably want to execute a query from it. And if you don't do anything beyond just declaring the method, then we go ahead and try to derive the query from the method name. So what we're actually go, uh, doing here is we um, chop off the, the first part of the, of the method name and keep um, the, the other parts of it and then parse this one to, uh, for property references and keywords. Um, so you can s easily have something like, oh, give me a second, customer first name, which would reference the first name property of the customer, uh, like, and you would have to pipe in a string here. Like this. Um, and you could combine this with end last name, uh, account expiry date before. I mean, you could, you could really go berserk with this. Um, and we actually start, when, we, when you start the spring container, we actually check that these prof property references really exist because, I mean, it's quite easy to get a typo in here and then pretty much rack up the entire query. Um, I can just show you that with the, uh, if, we start, if we start here again, and I refactor the method to contain a typo uh, and wait for, the, for Eclipse to um, refactor that correctly, and I rerun the test case, um, it will throw an exception saying, um, okay, there is no property customer for the domain class account, right? Because the infrastructure knows we have, um, we're actually having a repository for accounts, so we can validate the property references against the, the fields of the, of the uh, um, account class. <coughs> Customer, all right, okay. There's some keywords that you can use, there's and and or that you can use. Um, that's, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much it for query derivation, and um, yeah, so. In case the method name gets such long, or you want unit joins or more complex expressions, um, there's a few ways you can actually manually define the query. The most convenient one probably is just annotating the query with uh, from customer C where yada yada yada. You know, I'm probably what I'm shooting for, right? You can just um, this is not from customer C; it's from account A. But anyway. You get, the, you get the message, I think. Um, you can manually annotate them there. Um, then the method name pretty much doesn't matter anymore. Or you can use uh, just plain JPA name queries um, that by default have to follow a naming convention to be picked up, but that's all in the reference documentation. Just bottom line, in case you um, need more sophisticated queries, just manually define them. That's pretty much it. All right. Um, that's pretty much it for the account service, I think, right? So in this case, I'd argue the, um, the actual implementation became obsolete entirely uh, because uh, we, we don't need the entity manager anymore and a client could have potentially called or get just hold, uh, injected the, the account repository and um, not the, the additional interface implementation kind of thing. All right, so let's just recap what we did with the accounts in the um, customer service implementation. So the first thing we need to do is create an interface saying uh, customer repository. And <coughs> I go with CRUD repository right now in the first place for customer. Yada, 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 and it's long again, I think. All right, so doing that, we can actually go ahead and say, replace this with, oh, we need to inject it as well. Uh, customer repository, call it repo. And we say repo.find1. Um, we say return repo.find all. 
Um, let's see how we approach pagination. We can go with return repo.save. Right, okay, so we're done here. Why are we done here? There's some, compi there's some compiler error. It says find all returns an iterable, right? So actually the method declaration in CRUD repository returns an iterable. Why is that the case? Now the Spring Data Repository abstraction is not only available for JPA, but rather for NoSQL stores as well. Um, I think there's a talk on Spring Data Mongo this afternoon where maybe uh, this stuff gets mentioned as well. Um, and these NoSQL stores don't insist on loading the data, uh, or mo many of them don't it insist on loading the data all at once and return it and just thus populate your memory quite a lot. Uh, some of them actually um, allow to stream the data from the data store, like Neo4j, uh, the graph database, actually. And um, to allow this streaming kind of access to data, we return an iterable here. So what do we do now? Um, there's Java, a cool Java 5 feature, what we can use here. As the JPA always returns a list, we can, or we use that in... Uh, the method implementation. So we pretty much overrode the method with a more, uh, with a stronger return type, list instead of iterable. And that's why we can simply um, redeclare, where is the method uh, customer repository? We can simply go ahead and say, either we do it this way, we say list of customer, find all. So as indicated here, are indicated with the, with the marker here, we pretty much redeclare the method from the CRUD repository with a stronger return type, and thus can, it use, can use it from the client correctly. Um, if you don't want to do that uh, for each repository, there is a JPA repository interface that actually does that for you. Right. We could go ahead and just do this. I stick with, with this version here, um, and we have fixed this issue. Okay, so iterables versus lists in the JPA case. So the next crucial part actually is the pagination kind of stuff. Um, and I told you that I think it's a bit of um, suboptimal that we have two integers here. There's no, no real, what do these integers mean? We have to derive it from the, from the, uh, from the parameter name. There's, there's no, no higher level abstraction of pagination in here. <coughs> so, um, what, what we provide with the repository abstraction is a so-called yet another uh, repository interface. It's a so-called paging and sorting repository, which essentially uh, only contains two methods. Uh, and the most interesting one is the one below. It pretty much returns a page, which is some kind of a list on steroids. So the actual content among the metadata, am I the first page, am I the last page, is there a next page, how many pages are there in total, um, and all this kind of stuff. And the counterpart, the pageable, which is some kind of the request for a given page, right? And if we change our customer repository to return, uh, to rather uh, extend that one, that's probably breaking a bit we suddenly get access to methods like repo dot find all with a pageable. Okay, now where do we actually get the pageable from? Well, it's, there is a simple value object implementation that you can um, use is a new page request and pipe in the page and the page size, right? Um, and that returns a page that's the page, yada, yada, yada. Why is that? Okay. Ah, gosh, call it result, that's fine. Um, and now to, on the result, we could call things like get content, which returns the content of the page, uh, the number, the total elements, the total pages, yada, 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 all that stuff. And to satisfy the, the interface of that method, we just call get content, right? return the actual content of it. 
So if I had started from scratch here, I probably would not wrap the method in it just like, I mean, we're, we're pretty much having the lower abstraction outside here, create a more higher level abstraction, and then get a higher level abstraction and return the more lower level abstraction. But just to avoid the, the big giant refactoring here, I'll just stick to, to that stuff. All right, so the last, let's see if that still works. I mean, you have to trust me that the customer service integration test worked before, uh, but it read. That's cool. No pointer exception. Yada yada. There's probably a, an at auto wire missing. Yeah, we go. All right. That should do the trick. Okay, it's green again. So we've seen the pagination for, for all working. Um, now, what about the very last part? Executing a query and paginating the results of the query. Um, and just from combining both of the both of the features we've just seen, we actually could come to the assumption that we could go ahead and copy this method um, into the repository and change the return type to a page here and let it take a pageable. Right? So that would that would make actually make up the API that I would like to expose because that's pretty much, uh, or is, is taking, uh, is communicating what's going on here. And then we just have to write the adapter, the appropriate one, which would be return repo dot uh, find by last name. We pipe in the last name and we say new page request. Uh, just wrap the object again and then say get content. And save that and rerun the test case. And guess what? It's still green, right? So it's still working. Um, so what, what's actually going on under the covers is that we parse the, or we, we see, okay, this is a query that you want to execute. We derive the query from customer C where C dot last name equals question mark. And then we find this pageable parameter here, detect that it's a special parameter, and use the information provided in here to actually limit the result set of the query on execution time, of course. Um, and as the return type is a page, we need to trigger a second query to find out how many pages there would be in total, right? So we pretty much uh, execute a count projection of the query just defined here uh, onto the database. So you would get a second query uh, executed and then build up a, the object here that you could, could yeah, that stuff. All right, um, so once again, we've seen here that uh, we could, could get rid of all the manual implementation, so to speak, and what we're actually left with, if we started with Spring Data JPA from scratch, is um, these two interface definitions and um, non-implementation code at all for that stuff. Uh, so for CRUD and query execution, there's no need to write um, any line of implementation code anymore. All right, questions so far? So taking a break here and just recapping what we've done here. Okay, now we can just define queries as methods and interfaces. That's kind of neat. But um, this is, you probably don't write um, conference examples at work, but rather sophisticated software, which results in not only one method being um, declared in such an interface, but rather 10 or 20. And let's say you have the, the, the constraints, you want, to, um, you want to find all the customers by last name, and then you have another constraint saying you want to find all the customers by first name. And wouldn't it be cool if you could just combine those two, and, or combine those atomic predicates pretty much um, on the fly? 
right? So if you have to declare a query method for every possible combination of criteria, um, you would end up with quite a lot, quite a big repository interface. Um, not even considering the fact that you have to constantly add new methods and things would easily go out of hand. So it would be cool if we could just def were able to define atomic predicates and recombine them to execute them, right? So just giving someone this task or a JPA developer this task, he says, okay, this is what the criteria API is for, isn't it? Right. So as you've seen, um, only very few people have used it so far and not, I mean, even less people really enjoyed the experience. Um, there's gotta be some, some problem or what, what is the actual problem to use that? Um, let me have a look where the specification actually is. So one of the, the problem of the, of, the, of the criteria API is that it, one of the problems is that it requires quite some ceremony before you can actually start defining your predicates. You need to have an access to an entity manager, create a root, create a criteria builder, create a criteria query, yada, yada, yada. And because you need all that stuff to define the predicate, it's not easy to define the predicate on its own and reuse it. But rather, um, yeah, you, you have to come up with all that, that code on your own. And I just, I mean, even if I gave you two or three minutes to try to understand what that code means, I probably think some of you would struggle. I mean, I'm not saying um, you're not generally not capable to get that, but I just don't want to read code like this, right? It doesn't read fluent, it's not expressive, it's just like, huh, okay. I mean, even if you get it written, that's the first challenge. Come back two weeks later and read it and try to understand what's going on. Just that part here. I'm not talking about the ceremony on top of that. So, what we've come up with uh, is an idea that we actually derived from uh, Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design book, which is the concept of a specification. And it's defined as a predicate over an entity, which you can apply to a collection of entities then, and just filtering those out that match the specification. And what we ad allow you to do here is, um, it's, it's a bit like, or it works a bit like the, uh, the callbacks that you maybe know from JDBC template like connection callback or what have you, is that for the specification, we provide you with the interface, uh, with the infrastructure components so that you do, don't have to write the boilerplate code to set those up. And the only thing you need to do is inside this two predicate method, come up with a reasonable predicate, a reasonable business predicate, which is what I've done here. And what is actually behind this thing here is um, that I want to get all the accounts that expire before a given date, right? Just the predicate, the account expires before a given date. Um, that's that piece of code here. Right? And with the specification interface, you can just create an anon anonymous class and hide, it, hide the in instance behind this static factory method here, which can actually get a meaningful name and with code folding, you can just fold away all the nasty stuff. And now you have some means to reference, statically reference this predicate at some place in your code, right? And yeah, so we just need to get those things executed then. So we can come up with the specification. And how do we get them executed? I think I have prepared this already. So what we have here, uh, just, okay, the specification interface itself is for the definition of the, specific, uh, of the specification. There is a JPA specification executor interface that you add to your uh, list of uh, repositories you extend with the repository. And that contains CRUD methods, as you see, that take specifications. So that take these predicates. So what you actually can do then is I think I should have this in the after package. You use that, you've seen how we just defined the predicate account expires before a given date, right? 
that's in here. It's still a bit ugly, but it can be hidden. So how do we consume those? Um, as our, our repository extends this JPA specification executor, um, we have the method available saying repository, find all, taking a specification, and as we now statically, or we are able to statically reference the, um, the specification, we can just go account expires before expire limit, right? And I mean, it's the funny thing is I've I've turned the all the braces and and uh, uh, I changed the color of the braces in my IDE to be a light gray, which gets even better I think in the in the in the screening case because r right now you just already read this line of code like an almost fluent English not even, not really sentence but yeah what have you right. it, it reads quite fluent that's that's the case here um, to be able to combine these predicates with each other say you want to find let's say you have a second uh, predicate defined here um, and you want now on the fly combine both predicates with and or or um, there's this where method on a specifications helper object which you can use to then go and say and let's say account expires before yada 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 yeah. it doesn't really make a lot of business meaning here but um, it just allows you to define these criteria, the predicates um, in a very meaningful way in a very readable way an approachable way. All right, so there's some, what you've seen here is some improvements to the way you can work with the JPA criteria API. Um, and it gets better on the usage side of things. So at this point here, where you actually execute the predicate, um, it's still a bit of nasty and ugly at this point here, right? At the definition side of things. and. Have you heard of the, uh, the project Query DSL? Has anyone ever heard of it? Not. So, oh, there's one. Okay, in case two. Uh, in case you, um, so if there's one thing you should remember from this talk, um, it's the Query DSL project because it's pretty much the criteria API done right. And the cool thing about it is not it, that it's done right, it's also not only done for the JPA, but also for MongoDB, for plain Hibernate, for JDO, for plain collections even. And what, what that actually does is um, you create some kind of meta model from your classes. I mean, that's possible with JPA as well, but still the API is not getting any, any real better with that. It's just replacing concrete object references with, um, for strings. But um, with CurryDSL, you generate meta model classes for your classes that can be done by your aunt or maven or what have you. And in this case, uh, I just have the ones created for customer and account. And that's a typical meta model class. Instead of just a string property first name, you now have a string path. So some kind of meta model expression of it. And what you do here is, um, I think I've done this for the uh, account, the predicate here. Um, you can now use the, uh, these generated classes to actually define predicates. And that looks, compared to the, um, to the, to the uh, criteria API, pretty much looks like this. You say, you have your reference to your, to your static object there, to the static root reference, and then you do control space, and you get um, customer. And you say customer, and then you say dot control space, and you get first name, last name, what have you, right? And say first name. And as first name is a string property, um, Query DSL generates the appropriate methods, like, um, like. Yeah? And as it's a, a generation approach, you can, it can actually take the, the type of the property into account because uh, before or after doesn't really make sense for strings, but probably makes sense for dates, right? Uh, just like you see here, the before method is actually a generated one on a date path property. So we provide, I mean, you see here, we've, I've just defined some business predicates here as well. 
And the actual um, execution works pretty much the same way. Um, you, instead of extending uh, the JPA specification executor, you define the query DSL predicate uh, executor. This one for accounts. And that allows you to go through the test case and say, oh, where's the, there some, should be some test snippet. Uh, there we go. Right, that's it. Put that one in here. And you see that um, what we define here or the actual call is account repository uh, find all where they expire before the new local date and then you pipe in a day, right? Uh, you could just go ahead with, let's say, what, what, what else do we have on account? Uh, probably nothing. Um, Q account, account dot, okay. We could just go ahead with is, no, let's take this as pretty kit, and that's just the expression customer is null. Call it this way, and we could easily just trigger uh, find all expires before and customer is null. Right? And once again, I probably just add some more new lines here. You can see it. Uh, once again, it reads. Very, nat uh, very native, uh, very naturally, and um, can actually um, be read and understood quite well. All right, so there's actually two options for this more flexible querying approach. The JPA criteria API hidden behind the specifications API and um, the query DSL project. All right, so that's it for the demo, I think. Um, there's something I haven't mentioned. Uh, let's go back to the slide then and uh, continue from there because it's pretty much recap and outlook and what have we. So what you've seen is uh, CRUD on steroids. I call it steroids. I mean, steroids is the pagination stuff. There's so and sorting API, which you can use. Um, it's pretty much that. Uh, we have seen declarative query methods. So either you can derive the query methods from the method names or um, manually define them with an annotation or what have you. These things combined, I argue, uh, remove the need for a very large part of your, of your uh, data access implementation code. We've seen the specifications, just improvements to the criteria API and query DSL. So what's in there be beyond that, what I didn't show actually, is we have some rudimentary support for auditing, which means that you capture who has created an entity, when what did that happen, and who has modified it, um, and when did that happen. Right? There's some entity listener with just some callback where you uh, just tell the infrastructure, okay, who is my current user? And the entities get that stuff automatically set when they are persisted. Um, yeah, there's stuff in there. Um, there is the possibility to integrate custom code. So in case you have uh, the need to execute data access logic, um, how do you integrate them with the interface definitions and stuff? Um, that's a bit, a bit of more advanced topic. That's why I didn't sh show it here. Uh, there's quite a lot of reference documentation on it. Um, but it's possible, so you, do, you only pretty much only write implementation code for the stuff you really need. Right? All this, this um, the 80% data access code is just declared, so to speak. All right. Um, the project, in general, just to sum things up, is at springsource.org slash spring data. We have the repository abstraction that you've seen here that starts with pagination and what have you is implemented in the MongoDB module and the Neo4j module as well. So in case you're experimenting with NoSQL databases, um, that programming model is available um, to you through the Spring Data project as well. 
there will be uh, the support will be coming for uh, Spring Dead, Spring Gemfire. Um, I think mid this year, um, and other databases probably as well. We we are still looking into which ones are actually worthwhile putting some effort into. But um, yeah, Mongo and Neo4j are the uh, the next or the, the the two sister projects, so to speak, in terms of the repository abstraction. All right. So then, are there any questions? There's a question. To what? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so the question was about the, the strategy we apply when deciding whether a, an entity is new or not. And it was all hidden inside, um, where are we? It was all hidden inside simple JPA repository. There is a save method. And it pretty much says entity information. And that entity information is of type entity information. That's why it's called this way. Um, and it's actually a just an interface that or the, the instance that is actually deciding that is created in the factory. So in case you want to change, I mean, there's, there's two default approaches. Uh, the first one is we find an add ID, add embedded ID, all the ID types um, by reflection and just inspect it to be null or not, just like you would do it usually. That's, as I think, the 80% case. In case you want to get programmatic control over that, there's an interface you can implement with your entity where you have to implement is new. And as soon as your entity implements that interface, we would just call this method. Um, if you don't want to do that, you have to hook into the, uh, into the factory actually creating the proxy and stuff. There's a method that actually instantiates this entity information. And you could override this and have a general um, strategy change pretty much for is new. You could inspect the version field, have a Boolean flag, what have you. Right. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could generally you could do almost everything in there because you have a method that it's called. Um, I mean, we can, we can have a chat about the approach then um, offline because I think it gets very special here. But, but there is a hook where you can just define how this is defined either per entity or generally for all your repositories. And you want to do. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if that's not